This is Chapter 5, Dimensional Analysis and Similarity, Part 2. In this video, I'll be discussing the procedure of dimensional analysis. I'll start with an introduction to the general utility of dimensional analysis for things like extracting data from small wind tunnel models. Then I'll go through the detailed mathematics of the Buckingham Pi theorem. This is the procedure for determining the dimensionless parameters for a problem, and I'll be using the method of repeating variables. And then I'll end the video with an example. And this is the example, or a variation on the example, that we talked about in part one. I'm going to look at the dimensionless parameters for the drag force, the so-called form drag, for flow over a rectangular plate. The main reason we need dimensional analysis is because many practical fluid flow problems are just too complex to solve analytically. For example, turbulent flow has no exact solution, so for these kinds of flows we must resort to experiments or perhaps approximate modeling using computational fluid dynamics. In either case, the question that arises is how should we present the resulting data? As I discussed for the video in part one, in this chapter we will show that the data from these kinds of experiments are best presented in dimensionless form. When you use dimensionless form, you present the data in the most compact way, and it also minimizes the amount of effort and expense you have to go to when you do the experiments. Not only that, the data when presented in dimensionless form has the most generality. It's not for a specific fluid, it's not for a specific velocity, it's presented in a generic way which can be used for a wide range of conditions. In addition, the concept of similarity or similitude can be used to relate results that are obtained on small-scale physical models to the full-scale problem, and this is the classic problem of wind tunnel testing or scaling up results from a wind tunnel. And I've shown over here on the right a couple of examples. Here we have uh, a wind tunnel with a small model of a jet aircraft and it would be measuring the drag and the lift forces on the aircraft. I took the photo on the bottom right here from uh, my alumni magazine at Western where they obviously did the uh, wind tunnel testing on the, the twin towers of the World Trade Center. And we'll be discussing the problem of scaling up results from wind tunnel tests to the real-world full-scale problem in uh, upcoming video. So given that we want to present our data in dimensionless form, we're going to determine the dimensionless parameters using a procedure called dimensional analysis. As you may recall from the introductory videos to this course, I did my degrees at the University of Western Ontario, so I thought I'd do a little promo for the Boundary Layer Wind Tunnel, which is located at Western. The Boundary Layer Wind Tunnel uh, was a pioneering center and still is a pioneering center for wind tunnel testing of large-scale structures. And what they do is they test these structures in a quite a large wind tunnel, and they use uh, similarity parameters dimensionless parameters to scale up data from tests on these small-scale physical models to predict the, the behavior of the full-scale structure. And on this slide I've shown two images. On the left you can see a small model of the Confederation Bridge. This is the bridge that connects New Brunswick to Prince Edward Island. It was first opened in 1997 and they did testing on the this bridge to determine wind loads, also to look at the effect of the wind on the safety of cars on the driving deck to determine, you know, under what wind conditions you could still allow drivers to safely drive on the bridge. And they also looked at flow-induced vibrations, something called fluid structure interactions. It's also called aeroelastic testing. It's a nice example of using dimensional analysis in engineering. And this is an example of 
of not using dimensional analysis in engineering. It relates to a spectacular failure of the bridge at Tacoma Narrows that happened in 1940. And as you'll see in the video I'm going to show, on a particularly windy day, flow-induced vibration destroyed this early suspension bridge, which was located at Puget Sound in Oregon in the United States. Let me just show the video. It was known that the, that the bridge had instabilities and would, would wave and twist in the wind. And then on one particularly windy November day, the wind was so bad that it destroyed the bridge. Perhaps you've seen the footage. It's quite spectacular. Nowadays, of course, such large bridges would be routinely tested in wind tunnels like the Boundary Layer Wind Tunnel to avoid this kind of problem. In an upcoming video, we'll talk about how you can use dimensional analysis to scale up results from a small-scale model in a wind tunnel to a full-scale structure. So now we'll move on to the mathematics of dimensional analysis. Before we can do that, I want to review the principle of dimensional homogeneity, PDH in short. We talked about this in chapter one. The principle of dimensional homogeneity is the really the entire basis of dimensional analysis, so I wanted to review it here. Here's a statement of PDH a complete equation that expresses the relationship between variables in a physical process must be dimensionally homogeneous. So additive terms must have the same dimensions. And I've shown an example here that you should be familiar with. Recall Bernoulli's equation, which we applied on a streamline between two points. So at point one, we had some pressure, elevation, and velocity. And then the fluid flowed along a streamline to point two, where we had some different pressure, elevation, and velocity. And we set the energy at point one equal to the energy at point two because this was a frictionless flow. So we had the pressure energy per unit mass at point one, the kinetic energy per unit mass at point one, the potential energy at point one, and similarly the pressure energy at point two, the kinetic energy at point two, and the potential energy at point two. Now you can see that each one of these terms has the dimensions of length squared over time squared. So it's an example of a dimensionally homogeneous equation. Now some of these terms are obvious, right? I mean velocity here has units of meters per second, so length over time. And so when you square it, obviously you're going to get length over time squared. But the pressure terms, for example, are probably not as obvious. But don't worry about memorizing this sort of thing. If you can remember the units for the variables, it's very easy to reproduce. So there's no need to memorize. And here I'm going to show, for example, from first principles, we can show the dimensions of pressure over density. So pressure over density, right? The units of pressure is newtons per meter squared. And then the units for density is cubic meters per kilogram. So that cancels with that. We just end up with Newton meter per kilogram. Now you got to remember, you do have to memorize F equals ma. So F from F equals ma, we know that a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. And then I've rewritten again the meter kilogram. And so you can see that the kilograms cancel. And you just end up with meters squared over second squared, which of course gives the result. That isn't immediately obvious, and you shouldn't attempt to memorize it, but you can see that the pressure energy term has dimensions of length squared over time squared. Now we're ready to discuss the 
details of the Buckingham Pi theorem, which is the method of deducing the dimensionless parameters for a, for a problem. I'll start with a statement of the Buckingham Pi theorem. If an equation involving n variables is dimensionally homogeneous, it can be reduced to a function of k equals n minus j dimensionless products, where j is the minimum number of reference dimensions needed to describe the variables. So for example, imagine a problem involving n variables. So thinking back to our drag problem of the first video, u1 here might be the, the drag force that you're after. It's the dependent variable, the variable that you're seeking the answer for, if you like. And then it's dependent upon a number of other variables, u2, u3, all the way to un. So these would be, for the drag problem, your density, uh, viscosity, geometry effects, things like that. Now, as we discussed in the previous slide, the principle of dimensional homogeneity requires that the dimensions on the left side and the right side of that equation must be the same. If that condition is satisfied, then Buckingham Pi theorem says that such an equation can be expressed as a set of dimensionless products denoted by the symbol pi. And so we can have we have pi 1, and then pi 2, pi 3, and all the way up to pi k, where k, the number k here, is less than the number n by the number of reference dimensions j. So the problem can be expressed in terms of these k dimensionless products or dimensionless terms, and we get a reduction in the number of variables that we need to consider by the number of reference dimensions. I should mention that the symbol pi, this capital uh, letter pi, is used because the dimensionless terms that we're going to derive are products. Remember, we use the Greek symbol sigma for sums, and similarly, we use the capital letter pi for products. And that's where the name comes from. That's why it's Buckingham Pi theorem, right? Because we're dealing with these dimensionless products. Now, there are a number of different ways to derive the dimensionless products using the Buckingham Pi theorem. I'm going to use the sort of the most classical approach that's in most textbooks, the method of repeating variables. In one of the last videos of Chapter 5, I'll discuss another method called the Ipsum method. But the method of repeating variables is probably the most classic approach. It's the method that I like the best. And it has six steps that we're going to go through, and then I'm going to do an example. So step one is you're going to list the n variables in your problem, whatever problem you're interested in. And I should mention here that dimensional analysis has its roots in fluid mechanics, but it's used in a lot of other fields, not just fluid mechanics. So if you have a problem that has a functional relationship associated with it, you use your knowledge of the physics of the problem to deduce the n variables that are involved. And it's really important that you get all the key variables, all the, the quantities that affect the problem, otherwise your pi parameters will be wrong. And the variables have to describe all the applicable effects. And there's three sort of general categories in fluid mechanics that you can think of if you're trying to come up with a list of n variables. One is geometric effects. So let's, for example, suppose we're trying to characterize pressure drop in a pipe, turbulent flow in a pipe, perhaps. The geometry effects would be the pipe diameter, perhaps surface roughness, uh, pipe length of the pipe, that sort of thing. Then you've got fluid properties. So viscosity, density, if you had a free surface, maybe surface tension would be important. And then external effects, uh, driving pressure gradient, gravity that sort of things. Now it's really important that all the variables that you pick in your list of n be independent. For example, uh, if you were considering the, the pipe problem that I mentioned earlier, you don't want to include both the diameter and the cross-sectional area of the pipe as variables n because they're not independent. Given the diameter of the pipe here, you can calculate the cross-sectional area, so you'd use you'd include in your list of n variables either 
the cross-sectional area or the diameter, but not both. Similarly, if your problem involves fluid density and specific weight, if they're important, you'd list two of rho, gamma, g, because they're not independent. Uh, gamma equals rho g, so given any two of those properties, you can deduce the third. So all your, your list of n variables have to be independent. The next step is to express the variables in terms of basic dimensions, and we went through this in chapter 1 in some detail, and that's why we, we spent some time on this in chapter 1. And you can use either the M L T theta scheme or the F L T theta scheme. So that stands for mass, length, time, and temperature, or force, length, time, and temperature. Either scheme is okay. And of course, the conversion between those two schemes comes from F equals MA. So the dimension of force has the dimensions of mass, length, over time squared, because a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. And this harks back to chapter one. I showed this table in chapter one. These are the dimensions of some variables like power and density. And most of them are pretty straightforward, like velocity is distance per unit time. So of course, it's length over time. And the thing I'd like to emphasize is there's no need to memorize the contents of this table. If, if you know the units of the variable, you can quite easily deduce its dimension uh, or dimensions. And I will do an example of that later in this video. Then step three is to determine the number of pi parameters. And the Buckingham Pi theorem says that the number of pi terms, the number of dimensionless terms, is equal to n minus j. N is the number of variables in your problem, and J is the number of basic dimensions. And you find J just by inspecting the list of variables which you created in step two. This will become more clear when we do an example. Just so I'm not remiss, and as an aside, I should mention that in rare cases, the basic dimensions appear in combinations. So the number of basic dimensions can be less than the number of dimensions and the variables. I know, realize that's probably not clear at the moment. There's an example in the textbook that deals with this quite rare problem. I will leave it up to you to read the details. So step four then is to select J repeating variables from the total list of N variables that you have. And remember J is the number of basic dimensions in your, in your variables. These become so-called repeaters, and they appear in all your dimensionless terms, all your pi terms. I'm going to call repeating variables repeaters. There's three rules for selecting repeaters. One is here, all the basic dimensions in the problem must be included in the repeaters. We will check this. The repeating variables themselves cannot form a dimensionless product. We'll also do a careful check of this on every problem. And you do not want to pick as a repeater the parameter of interest, the independent parameter. So the thing you're interested in, like the drag on the plate, you don't want to pick it as a repeater because it'll get buried in all the pi terms. And this will make more sense once we've done an example. And then step five, you form your k pi terms. So the, the k is the number of dimensionless terms you're going to get. You start with n variables and then you reduce those variables by the j dimensions. So you form those k pi terms and you form them in a way that I've shown here. Here. Now this looks a little bit complicated, but I think it'll be more clear when we do an example. So you set up your repeating variables, u1, u2, u3, all the way up to uj with arbitrary exponents, a1, a2, a3, aj. And then you have your your, one of your non-repeating variables here. And what you do is one by one you figure out what these exponents have to be so that the pi product, so that this pi product here is dimensionless. And so using this procedure one by one you can solve for the exponents and determine the pi terms. So dimensionless term one, two, three, all the way up to k. 
then finally, once you've got your, your k dimensionless terms, you express them in the final form. Pi 1 is a function of pi 2, pi 3, all the way up to pi k. And of course, you put the, the uh, dependent variable in uh, the numerator of pi 1. That makes sense. You don't want it on the bottom. And of course, you should remember that the, the functional relationship f2 here, we don't know what that is. And that has to be determined by experiments. But by applying dimensional analysis, you've reduced the number of variables substantially by the amount j, actually. Uh, so you have to do a lot less experiments to find the functional relationship between these dimensionless terms. So we'll end this video with an example. So let's consider aerodynamic drag on a rectangular plate. Consider that we want to experimentally characterize the drag force, the so-called form drag, FD, on a rectangular plate produced by the flow of fluid perpendicular to the surface. An application for this would be determining the wind load on billboard signs. Of course, the wind load on those signs is important for designing the support structure. So you're told that the drag force is a function of the fluid velocity, the fluid properties, rho and mu, and the dimensions of the rectangular plate. The plate has height h here and width w. And given these variables, we want to determine the dimensionless parameters, the pi terms, needed to conduct an experiment to characterize the drag force. And I'll remind you that this is a variation on the example that I discussed in the video for part one. So the first step in the problem is to list the n variables. In this case, you're told in the problem statement that the drag force is a function of the size of the plate, so width and height, velocity, dynamic viscosity, and density. So we have six variables. Now it's a common mistake to actually just count the variables, uh, the independent variables here, and think come up with five. So don't forget to include the dependent variable, the thing you're after, in the count. So there's actually one, two, three, four, five, six variables. Now, if you think about this for a moment, this problem about characterizing drag on a plate, surely the area of the plate matters. The bigger the area, the more drag there is on the plate. So why didn't we include the area of the plate as one of these variables? You might pause the video and think about this for just a minute, and then I'll give the answer. The answer is because the area of the plate is equal to the width times the height. So area is not independent. We've already included h and w in our list, so we don't want to include area because it wouldn't be an independent variable. If we included area, we'd have to take out one of h or w. We, can include, we could include area and w or area and h, but we can't include all three. So we've done a check that all the parameters are independent. So step two is now to express all the variables in terms of their basic dimensions. And I'm going to use the mass, length, time, and temperature scheme. Uh, you can use the force, length, time, and temperature scheme if you like. So here I've listed each of the six variables. So the drag force, of course, in newtons would be kilogram meter per second squared. So that's right. Width has units has, sorry, dimensions of length, height has dimensions of length, density is mass per volume, so mass over length cubed. I'll come back to uh, the units for dynamic viscosity in a moment. Velocity is length over time, so that's correct. Now, you can go to the table and look up the units for dynamic viscosity, but suppose you're on an exam and you're not given that table. Well, there's no need to memorize the dimensions for dynamic viscosity. You can de 
deduce it by knowing Newton's law of viscosity. So if you know tau equals mu du dy, now that you should memorize. That's a basic piece of knowledge that you should have at your fingertips, just like F equals ma and V equals ir. It's a very basic equation. So once you, once you, you have that basic knowledge, you can deduce mu from the fact that it's tau over the velocity gradient. So tau is a stress, so stress is newtons per square meter. And then we have a velocity, meter per second, of course it's on the bottom, so it's meter and then second on the top. And then dy here is a distance, and it's on the bottom of, of du dy on the denominator, so it comes up on the top. So we can cross this out with this. Now I've made that substitution, that, and I've still got second over meter squared here, and we can cancel that with that, and we can cancel that with that, and you can see you get kilogram over second meter. So you can deduce in just really a few seconds that the dimensions of dynamic viscosity or mass over time times length. So there's no need to memorize this, but you should know Newton's law of viscosity. So now we've figured out the basic dimensions in all our variables. Now it's just a matter of counting. There's three basic dimensions. There's J equals three basic dimensions in our variables. We have mass, length, and time. And that'll probably be the same in all of the problems you do, unless you're dealing with a problem that's not isothermal and you have uh, some temperature involved, some, some heat transfer. And we have six variables. We counted them in the previous slide. So the Buckingham Pi theorem says that we have k equals n minus j, so 6 minus 3. So we have three dimensionless numbers or dimensionless pi terms that are going to describe the drag force on this plate. So now we go after getting those dimensionless pi terms. We do this step four by selecting j equals 3 repeating variables from our list of six variables. And I've listed over here, I've shown over here, there's our, there's our generic problem, there's our six variables. And we need to pick three of these as repeating variables. And there's some rules for repeating those variables, repeating variables that I've uh, listed here again. So we don't want to pick independent parameter as a repeater. So we don't want to pick, we certainly don't want to pick FD. And whatever three we pick, all of the dimensions, mass, length, and time, have to be in those repeaters. And the repeating variables themselves cannot form a dimensionless product, and that requires a, a separate check. So I have somewhat arbitrarily selected three repeaters. I've selected W, V, and Rho. Other choices are possible and completely correct, as long as they satisfy the three rules above. So let's check that the three conditions above are satisfied. Of course, we haven't picked FD, so we're okay on that. Let's check uh, that all the reference dimensions are included. So I've written down uh, the dimensions here. W has dimensions of L, velocity, length over time. Uh, density has math, mass over length cubed. So we have all three. We have we have mass, length, and time included in our, the three that we picked, so it satisfies that requirement. The last requirement is that the repeating variables themselves can't form a dimensionless product. I like to do this very rigorously to make sure this can't happen. So what, what I do is I write down the three repeating variables, W, V, and Rho, and I write them with exponents, A, B, C. So w to the a, v to the b, rho to the c, and now I've written the, the dimensions in here. So I've substituted the dimensions in here. So that's what I've got here. And then I've expressed them as exponents a, b, c, and the question is can they form a product where the exponents on length, mass, and time are all zero. Is that possible? Well, to check that, what you do is you match exponents on the left and the right. And so now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with mass. Now, mass here is raised to the exponent c, and it doesn't appear in any of the other terms. So in order for this to be dimensionless in terms of mass, c would have to equal zero. 
So that term goes away. Next, I look at time. Time only appears in this term. In order for this product to be dimensionless, b would have to equal 0. And now we're left with only this term here, and the only way it could be dimensionless, because it contains the dimension L, is that a equals 0. So that tells me that, therefore, non-zero values of a, b, and c do not exist that would produce a dimensionless term. So there's no way that these three variables can form a dimensionless term, and we've satisfied that third requirement up here. So step five now, we form our three pi terms. Remember, we have six variables and three basic dimensions. So six minus three means we have three pi terms. Okay, so we've picked w, and we've picked v, and we've picked rho as our repeating variables. So one by one with f, h, and mu, we go and we form these dimensionless products and I've written down all three here so in the first dimensionless product we pick F F D the second dimensionless product we pick H the third dimensionless product we pick mu and these are the repeating variables raised to these unknown powers a1 b1 c1 so for the first term the first pi term we use the drag force for the second pi term we use the non repeater H and for the third pi term, we use the non-repeater mu, the dynamic viscosity. And we, in each one of those pi terms, we've got these repeating variables raised to unknown exponents. Now what we do is we go one by one and we determine what those exponents must be. So we start with pi 1 and we determine what a1, b1, and c1 must be in order for it to be dimensionless. And that'll give us pi 1. And you'll see in the next slide that this is surprisingly easy. And then we go to, to uh, pi 2 and pi 3 and do the same thing. And that gives us our three pi products. So let's go one by one, starting with pi 1. So starting with pi 1 now, I'm using the, the term that has as the non-repeater the drag force. We have our repeaters. I drop the the numeral 1 on a, b, c, just to make things simpler. So we have w to the a, v to the b, uh, and then density to the c. Now what I've done it, uh, in, over here, I've substituted in the, uh, the dimensions. So force has mass, length over time squared. w as unit has dimensions of distance, velocity, distance over time, and mass over length cubed is density, so that's correct. Now what we want to do is we want to figure out what a, b, and c have to be so that there's no dimensions, uh, so that this pi product is dimensionless. So we have l to the 0, m to the 0, and t to the 0. And the way we do this again is we match exponents on the left and right side. So I'm going to start with the exponents for m here. So let's look at the exponents for m. Well, here we have m to the 1, so that's 1, and this doesn't have m, this doesn't have m, here we have m to the c, so c, and then on the right-hand side, m has to have the exponent of 0. So in order for this to be dimensionless, 1 plus c has to equal 0. That tells us that this exponent here, c, has to equal minus 1. Now we repeat the same procedure, but now for time. So we look at the, the uh, exponents of these terms. t squared appears on the bottom here, so that's minus 2. There's no t here. This is going to be minus 1. And there's no time in the density term, so we don't include that. And it's got to all add up to 0. So on the the right hand side. So that gives then that b equals minus 2. And now we do the same thing for, for the dimension of length. Here we have a l to the 1, so 1 plus a plus b mi minus 3c here, because l cubed is on the bottom and we have a c here, has to equal 0. So 1 
plus a plus b minus 3c equals 0. And that's obtained by looking at the exponents on the left and right side of this expression. And now I've, I know what c and b are, so I've solved for a. And that gives a equals minus 2. You can check my arithmetic there. So now we have a, b, and c. I'm just going to substitute them back in here. So this is, this is minus 2. b is uh, minus 2 as well. And c is minus 1. The first pi parameter is fd, w to the minus 2, v to the minus 2, rho to the minus 1. And then I've just rewritten here, uh, rewritten that expression. So we get fd upon w squared v squared rho. Now remember, we want to check that this is dimensionless to make sure we've done our analysis right. Remember from Bernoulli's equation that rho v squared is a pressure, it's a dynamic pressure. So this we know from Bernoulli's equation, uh, we could check it if you, in other ways if you wanted to, but I know from working with Bernoulli's equation that rho v squared is a pressure and w squared is an area. So pressure times area gives a force. We have a force on the bottom. We have a force on the top. So I've just very quickly confirmed to myself that I haven't made a mistake, and that term is dimensionless. Now we can move on. We've got pi 1. We can move on to pi 2, the second dimensionless pi term. And now we use this, the non-repeating variable h in this one. So I've done exactly the same thing. I've written the repeating variables w to the a, v to the b, rho to the c, and now I've written the non-repeating variable in here. We do the same thing. We repeat, we put, we put the dimensions in for each one of the variables, and then we do this, this matching from, uh, of exponents. And from this, okay, when you look at the exponents for m, we have c only appears, m only appears in the rho term, so we have c equals 0. That's correct. When we do it for t, t only appears in this term, so um, minus b equals 0. That's correct. So b is going to equal 0. And when we do it for l, we're going to have 1 plus a plus b minus 3c equals 0. So that's correct. And we know that c and b are 0, so we get so b and c or zero, 0, so we get that a equals minus 1. Now we've got our exponents. We can write them back in here. We get h, w to the minus 1, v to the 0, rho to the 0, v to the 0, and rho to the 0 are 1. And so we get that our pi parameter is just the height over w. This is called the aspect ratio of the, uh, of the plate, which, of course, is obviously dimensionless. Both the top and the bottom have dimensions of length. Moving on now, we can get the third pi term using a dynamic viscosity as the non-repeater. So we put the non-repeater the non in here, and we repeat the same thing. I've substituted in the variables, and they must it must be dimensionless. So we go through this again for m. Let's just check this. We have 1 plus c equals 0. That's correct, so c equals minus 1. And now for t, we have minus 1 minus b equals 0. That's correct, so therefore b equals minus 1. And here we would have minus 1 plus a plus b minus 3c equals 0, so that's correct. And we, we know what b and c are. You can check my arithmetic. You get a equals minus 1. You make the substitution now and we get that the third dimensionless parameter is mu over w v rho. And you might recognize this as the inverse of Reynolds number. Remember, Reynolds number is a, is a characteristic dimension, in this case the, the width of the plate, times velocity, times density, divided by dynamic viscosity. And we know Reynolds number is dimensionless, so 1 over Reynolds number is also going to be dimensionless. So we've checked that we haven't made a little arithmetic error. So now in the final step, we put together these three pi parameters. We set, we set pi 1 equal to some function of pi 2 and pi 3. Now we don't know this functional form. That's to be determined by experiments. And we've, we have our three pi parameters here that we've just determined. Pi, 
pi 1, pi 2, and pi 3. So we get that the dimensionless drag force is a function of the aspect ratio in this 1 over Reynolds number. We recognize that that's 1 over Reynolds number. And any pi parameter can be inverted if necessary. We don't know what the functional relationship is, so we can just invert, if for our convenience, we could invert any one of these pi parameters and just change it to a, some other unknown function. So I've rewritten this uh, inverting here, uh, the last term, so that we have Reynolds number. So what we get to end rewriting the result, we end up with the dimensionless drag force. This is actually over here, the dimensionless drag force is actually sometimes called the drag coefficient, is a function of the geometry of the problem, so the aspect ratio of the, of the plates and the Reynolds number. And that's about as far as you can go. It is as far as you can go with dimensional analysis. The unknown function F3 cannot be determined by dimensional analysis. At this point now, you have to resort to experiments, but with greatly reduced effort because you've gone from six dimensional parameters down to three non-dimensional parameters. I'd like to also emphasize that the pi parameters are not unique. If you picked a different initial choice of repeaters, you'd end up with a, a different set of pi parameters that would be just as valid provided the repeaters satisfy those three rules that we went over. So just to emphasize, this result stems from the principle of dimensional homogeneity, and it's the same general result as I discussed in the video for part one. And we've seen a reduction from six dimensional variables down to three dimensionless variables. And as we discussed in the first video, for fixed geometry, so if you fix the aspect ratio, the dimensionless drag would be only a function of the Reynolds number. And so for a square plate, for example, if you had an aspect ratio of 1, you'd only have to do one set of experiments. You'd just have to run Reynolds number and measure this dimensionless drag force and then you'd have to repeat that experiment, say, for a different aspect ratio, say, 2. And I've just drawn hypothetical curves here. I don't know what those curves look like. Just to make the point that once you fix the geometry, the dimensionless drag force is only a function of the Reynolds number, and we've demonstrated that through uh, dimensional analysis. And that completes this video.